Hi guys, Mr. Kane here. Good to see you again. Hi guys, Mrs. Goswish. Mr. Kane, yeah? what's on the board now? Oh, hey, that's my new periodic table. It's magnetic. This is kind of something we do every once in a while, isn't it? We ask what's behind us. Yes, that's... Is that, or you ask what's behind us. I do, us. yes. Is that being slightly periodic? Uh, I think it might be is periodic. Is that a pattern? It's, it's, it's predictable, that's wow. for sure. Uh, today's topic is families and properties on the periodic table. So you're going to get the idea that some things are predictable. Some things are going to be pattern. Uh, we're going to dive right in. So we just wanted to point out uh, when we start out here, we're going to talk about metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. So we've got these highlighted. Notice the metalloids are all on the staircase. There are eight metalloids with the exception the, of aluminum. All of them touch the stairs, right? Okay. Uh, the metals are all going to appear in yellow. The metalloids are all going to appear green, and the nonmetals will all appear. Okay. Now these are the main categories of the periodic table, and then they're broken down into subcategories, right? Which is what we're going to start talking about next. Okay. We'll Sounds good. Hydrogen. Oh, one more thing while you guys are looking at your periodic table here. So we're going to we're going to add a couple things here. Common charges of ions. Okay. Now this isn't the charge of the atom, which a lot of people think, but it's the charge of the ions. So this group, the first group usually has a charge of one plus. That means it lost an electron Am and I, lost one electron. I, okay. The second group has a charge of two plus commonly. Meaning that it lost electrons and it lost two of them. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to skip all these guys in the middle, the transition metals, but when we get to group 13 we find that it is three plus. Three plus, so it lost electrons, three of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with the fourth group fourth group actually has two ways to go. It could be plus or it could be minus. With the exception of tin and lead. Okay, correct? with the exception of tin and lead. These are, these are exceptions here. So the okay. carbon, silicon, and germanium could gain or lose four electrons. Mm -hmm. Now here's where it gets a little funky. It starts going down. Nitrogen's group can be three minus. Okay, so it gained three electrons. Gained three electrons. Oxygen's group is two minus. Gained two electrons. And fluorine's group is one minus. All right. Helium, helium's group here. No charge. No charge. Okay. okay. They, they, they don't they, form charges. They do not form charges. Okay. All right. Let's get into it. We'll start talking with hydrogen. All right. Sounds good. We got hydrogen here. Okay. Which, uh, Mrs. G, this is the only element I think that has its own family. Yes, because it's not part of family number one, which includes the lithium, sodium, potassium guy. He is kind of an extraordinary element, Mr. Kane. He kind of has his own properties, his own everything, chapter. All right, let's run through a few of the properties here. Uh, he has a, uh, it says here, represented by the symbol H in the electron configuration 1s1, which that's kind of a preview. I think we're going to learn about that later. Okay, so energy levels, right? Yeah, so energy first levels. energy level, <laughs> and there's only one electron. One ener first energy level, one electron, but that's, we'll get to that before, cri okay. before Christmas, I hope. Uh, hydrogen's colorless, odorless, and tasteless. Tells bad, bad jokes, awful jokes. Um, forms elements with more compounds than any other elements, and that's probably because it's the most abundant element in the universe. Oh. And is it a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas in its element form, correct? In its elemental form, yes. Okay, but when then it can form other compounds that aren't necessarily gases, right? Right, like for instance, sugar, C6H12O6. Okay. C6H12O6. It's got 12 hydrogen atoms, and that's, that's sweet stuff. Okay, and that's a solid. Or water, yeah, liquid H2O. water at room temperature. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that supposedly has no taste, although around here. All right. Be, oh, care yeah. be careful of water. Lockport, yeah. yeah. But um, uh, that's that's the idea, and it's the most abundant element in the universe. If you doubt me, uh, check out what stars are made of. Oh, okay. Okay. Other things about hydrogen: there's very little of it free in the Earth's atmosphere because every time you get hydrogen gas, it's less dense than the air around it, and it goes up. Up. Okay. Up. The Hindenburg learned about that yeah, one. Yeah, the hard way. All right, and then the, the other thing uh, about that the Hindenburg learned is it's flammable. Very flammable. Extremely flammable. Oh, it's one of the diatomics. Yep, one of the diatomics. It's, it's almost like this is repetitious, you know. Science is repetitious. We've talked about that before. And it's got the lowest density. Okay. Alkali metals. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. This is the group one or family one, group or family interchangeable terms. 
This is group one. Notice that hydrogen is not considered an alkali metal, even though it's on top of lithium on the periodic table. It is not an alkali metal. They do not occur in nature as elements. Usually, it's a compound, a white salt compound. Yeah, white salts. Okay. And they're very reactive with water, huh? Yeah, extremely, uh, explosively reactive. Oh, yeah, good. Actually, I guess I should say, violently reactive with water. Oh. Yeah. Well, then they'd have to be they'd have to be careful just being exposed to the air because there's water in the air, isn't there? Exactly. Usually, if uh, you find these in a chem lab, you find them under oil because the oil doesn't allow any water in it. Okay. And the interesting thing is, is if you put lithium in water, you get a little fizzle. You put sodium in, it's a little bit more. Potassium gives you a nice pop. And by the time you get down to the bottom, which is francium, yeah, yeah. Which is francium and cesium, uh, and rubidium for that matter. Oh. You're talking about some pretty violent reactions happening. So there's a pattern there. Reactivity increases as you go down that family. There is a pattern there, and that is oh. a periodic pattern. Reactivity increases as we go down. So the reactivity increases as you go down the, the list here. Okay. okay. Uh, all of these, another thing to note, they all have one valence electron. By the way, guys, if you haven't taken out your periodic table yet, I would, and I'd write this fact down about valence electrons because that's something that's periodic. So valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost energy level, right. and everything in group one has one valence electron. Oh, I don't know. That's confusing. That's, uh, I could never remember <laughs> that. Va one valence electron for all the group one metals. The alkali metals, I'll never remember that. And one word, alkali. Ooh, okay. Ooh. Hey, yeah, it'd, be, it'd be nice if group two had two words for two, its yeah, name. Yeah, two words for its name. Okay. Ooh. Okay. So just just, uh, just to continue here, alkali metals, just like all, uh, just like most metals, they're good conductors of heat and good conductors of electricity. They're ductile, which means that you can pull them out into wires. They're malleable, which means you can flatten them out into sheets. And kind of move them around, right? Isn't that what we did with the magnesium ribbon? We did that with They're the magnesium. kind of flexible -ish. Yeah, flexible. Here we go. That's flexible. Okay. Um, these are a little bit different than most metals we're, we're, um, uh, we're familiar with because you can actually cut these with a butter knife. Oh, wow. Okay. It says a knife there, but butter knife is actually what okay. it should say because they're extremely soft. Uh, they have a silvery luster. They have low densities and low melting points. Matter of fact, lithium is the lowest density metal, and if it weren't actually reactive with water, it would float on water. Oh, okay. But since it reacts with water, it... Yeah, it kind of goes yeah, pop. kind of goes pop. And low melting points, okay. Low melting points, yeah, then that goes along with the softness. Ooh, group two, alkaline earth metals. Oh, look, there are two names in group two. Ooh, hey, that's nice, alkaline and earth. So there are two, group two, two names. I wonder how many valence electrons. Oh, wait, let me think. I'll bet there's two. It should be writing that down at the top of group two on your periodic table. All right, so beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium. We just listened to the element song. Can yeah. you sing that? No, I'm kidding. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, they do not occur naturally in their elemental state. Again, usually a salt, which and means a compound, right? Correct. And the part that I like about this, they're colorful salts. Salts. If you actually want to see what a colorful salt looks like, go to Wikipedia and look up uh, magnesium salts or calcium salts or strontium salts. Uh, they got pictures on there. They're actually pretty salts. They're less reactive than the alkali metals. Okay. They are also good conductors of heat and electricity. They are also ductile and malleable, and have a silvery luster. And the thing about these, they're not quite as soft as the alkali metals. Remember, we dealt with magnesium in class, and we kind of got to bend it a little bit. It bends, but it doesn't really cut with a knife. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we burnt <clears throat> that. That's the one we burnt with the big bright light, right? Yeah, that's right. And th this is kind of a pattern. So on the left, you got soft. On to the right of the left, you've got a little bit less soft. Yeah. And transition metals are even less oh, soft. Okay. There are, there are harder metals. Okay. Now, the groups 3 through 12 transition metals, they don't follow the periodic trends as well as we'd like them to, uh, but they do consist of metals. Okay. They do contain one or two valence electrons usually, although as we get into the deeper chemistry later in the year, we'll, we'll talk more deeply about why we say usually and okay. we're kind of hedging here. So transition metals typically have more than one potential charge. Yeah, yeah, that's that's another thing. Is All that right. uh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Usually harder and more brittle. Well, that makes sense. I mean, I'm looking at 
I see copper, I see zinc, iron. That would definitely be harder than a sodium. And they've got higher melting points and higher boiling points than the metals. Okay. Uh, right. One little issue with your periodic table, if you wouldn't mind, Mr. Kane. The germanium, antimony, and polonium. Ooh. Those are not transition metals. So let's cross That's those right. out real quick. I'm going to fix that up here. Notice, guys, these guys are next to the staircase. They are technically not metals, so we can't count them as transition metals. Yeah, they're metals. Uh, metalloids, semi-metals. One transition metal, though, that we should have included, and it's just in the picture here. The aluminum, isn't is it? Is aluminum. So you might want to just make a note that aluminum is a transition metal, but germanium, antimony, uh, and what was this? Polonium. Polonium. And on, on oh, I can't septinium, see okay. element number 117, <laughs> are not transition metals. They're malleable also, and ductile. Yeah, they're also yeah, malleable okay. and ductile. And we, we, should know, we should know that. We've seen... Aluminum foil. Out. I mean, iron, uh, nickel, yeah. copper, aluminum, uh, gold, silver. Most of the metals that we see in our everyday lives, like, uh, you know, platinum. Uh, so they're all, they're all metals we're familiar with. And notice also, there's two metals that don't have a silvery luster. Okay, copper and gold, that copper makes and sense. Gold. And we're both, we're familiar with both of those. Yeah. One of those is my favorite. And the other one is the one that I have a lot of. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. <laughs> okay. So, the inner transition metals, as they're called, maybe I should give the generic name first. Inner transition metals. There are actually two groups that are horizontal that we, we talk about as groups, but usually we talk about groups vertically. That's true. But uh, these are called the lanthanides and the act actinides, or the actinides, depending on who you are and where you're from. The lanthanides, you can see, start with lanthanum. Hmm, lanthanum. That's and hard. the actinides, or the actinides, as I call them, start with actinium. So these are the two rows that are always under the periodic table on any book or on our wall, correct? Mm -hmm. And they only put them on the outside, they only put them uh, on the bottom because they don't actually fit very well where they're supposed to go. On the periodic table handout we've got, there's a little gap where they're supposed to go. It, says, yeah. it, it, it actually says elements 50, 57 through 71 fit here. Um, they don't fit there because of the way printing goes. Okay, yeah, because your book would be awfully tall if we had to put that in the book as is. I can understand that. Okay, so the lanthanides, basically what you need to know is they're shiny silvery metals similar in reactivity to group 2. Okay. So they're extremely similar to the alkaline earth metals. Mm -hmm. Two names. All right. And the actinides all wind up being radioactive. Well, yeah, there's uranium, right? Yeah, uranium's in there, right? So, so this, that, that should be an obvious for you. They're all radioactive. Uh, only three of them were found on Earth. The rest of them were man-made as far Ooh. as the things that are on Earth. Synthetically they, made. They exist elsewhere in the universe, but... Not here. That uh, would explain why one of them is called Einsteinium. Somebody made it and called it after Einstein, huh? Yeah, and then this one here was made at the University of California, Berkeley. Berkeley, and I see and Curie. Cal and Californium. Okay. Fermium, named after, uh, oh, hey, Mendelevium. I wonder who, who uh, that gee, one got named after. That's a long stretch of the imagination, <laughs> no yeah? Nobelium, they should, they should start giving out prizes by a guy named Nobel. <laughs> that would be awesome.